Hey, what's up, car shipping rock stars? It's your girl Ashley from realgeek.com, and you're listening to episode seven of the Ship More Cars podcast. This episode is a very, very special one because I posted on Facebook that I wanted to get you guys' questions. I wanted your best questions, and I was going to choose one or two of them to answer on today's podcast. Um, I just really wanted to get you guys involved and create content that I know will help you. So what better way than to ask you what you want to want me to answer or talk about? I decided that I'm going to try to go through all of these questions because I feel like a lot of them are really good. So I'm going to try to go through as many of them as possible and still go into detail about them. Tiffany wrote, you provide so many of us with the educated tools we need to use to be successful in the auto transport business. But my personal question to you is why do you think you were so successful among many others in this industry? What made you stand out from the rest? This is a great question, Tiffany. And the reason why it's so great is because a lot of people, a lot of my students used to ask me that same question is what made me so different? How did I stand up? And Honestly, the reason I was able to stand out is because I did not focus on the things that a lot of brokers focused on. That's number one. And two, I was truly myself. And I can tell you that just being who I was, being who I am, putting my face out there, um, not being afraid to put my face on every little communication thing that I did, whether it was on my website, whether it was in the email signature, I literally would add my face everywhere. And I was proud of who I was. I was okay with the position I was in at that moment. So if I was new, I was okay with that. And I just literally just was being me. I spoke to people the way that I would talk to my parents, the way that I would talk to my child. You know, I just treated people like human beings and I didn't look at it as I'm just trying to get the sale. And because of that, that's how I was able to stand out. Now, success is a broad term, in my opinion. To everybody, success is different. For me, the definition of success was being profitable, being able to make money for my family, not having to have a separate job, things like that. So for me, my definition of success was freedom. And, you know, so when I, when people ask me about success, I just say to them, it depends on your definition of success. Like for some people, success means making six, seven figures. You know, for some people, success means just, you know, again, like me being able to take care of your family. For some people, success is, you know, predicated on how many followers they have. So depending on your definition of success, you might not, you might have different outcomes. So with that being said, a lot of brokers might not have looked at me as successful. And the reason for this is because I did not have 10, 20, 30 employees. And I had my reasons for not wanting 10, 20, 30 employees. So there are brokers I talk with all the time who they feel like they're successful because they manage a team, but it's easy to hire anybody. Like you can start your business today and hire a bunch of salespeople, but that doesn't make you successful. You understand? So But again, what made me stand out from the rest, and I tell you guys this all the time, I've talked about this in tons of videos, is just being you. If you be yourself, if you talk to people like they're human beings, then you will win. The next question is from Woodley Michael, and he says, I know I should speak to one in the beginning for legal structure, but should I hire an accountant in the beginning stage of starting or when income start rolling in? My answer to you, Woodley, is that you need to, and sorry if I butchered your name, I'm not really that good with names, but you should have an accountant from the beginning. The great thing about most accountants is that you don't have to pay them on retainer. You only pay them for the services they rendered. When I first started my business, I hired an accountant who I later fired, but I hired her and I only had to pay her for things like if I needed something, $200 or whatever it is I need at that time. But it's very important that you have an accountant at the beginning because you want to make sure that you're setting up your business the right way. Your legal structure matters. And although an attorney is great for that, also, you know, your accountant can tell you, you need to file an LLC S corp or maybe an LLC C corp. Like there's a difference between those things and only an accountant can know what is best for you. So I do think that you should have one. Um, and they will tell you, you know, what type of things you need to collect and keep, what counts as write-offs and what doesn't. So that way you're making sure that from the very beginning you're getting, it's not even only about how much you're paying out. It's how many de- deductions you can get. So if you know these things from the jump, when you're starting your business, then you're only going to set yourself up for 
you know, um, better success later. Um, especially if you have a great accountant. So yes, my question, my, my answer to you would be hire an accountant in the beginning. Calvin Williams says insurance is key to the door. What options are out there to get that $75,000 coverage at a good rate? I'm guessing because you mentioned 75,000 Calvin, you're talking about the brokering bond. There are so many different companies out there that offer bonds. Some of them are offering it for like a thousand dollars a year and others are like 3,500 to 10,000 a year. My suggestion to you is just Google a bunch of bond companies and contact them. I do have a resource section on my website over at relogeek.com forward slash resources that list a company that I recommend. I've, when I had my brokering business, the company that I chose was Pacific Financial. I had my full 10,000 in with them at first, and then I added 15,000 when the bond raised up to 75,000. So literally they had $25,000 of my money and I never once worried, are they going to go out of business and disappear? I never once worried when I'm ready to close my doors, will I be able to get my money back? I didn't have to worry about these things. And that peace of mind was well worth well worth it for me. So when people ask me what bonding company I recommend, I don't always recommend the cheapest because I don't know what the cheapest is. I only recommend based off of my experience and it's specific financial. And I, again, I leave the contact details on my website so you can contact the superstar Diane over there directly and just let her know that I sent you. But you do, you're not obligated to go with them. Choose who you feel best, who you drive with. Tyler Samsa writes, call quick or wait for the bombardment of calls to die down, then calls. And thank you to Amanda who wrote back, I wait to call until the bombardment is over. I find that potential customers appreciate that. So thanks, Amanda, for giving your input. I personally have done it both ways, and it really just depends. My number one rule is if you can call within the first five minutes, then do it. However, and first five minutes is a long time. I would prefer that you call within the first minute or two, but sometimes I understand that's not feasible. So once that lead has been in your system for more than five minutes, I say forget about it, wait till the calls die down, and then call. You would not believe how many leads I converted from waiting. Granted, I converted a lot of leads from calling immediately, but the bulk of my leads were either from call, from waiting later or, or even just in the follow-up. And I tell you guys this all the time, um, Tyler follow-up is going to be where the money is at because believe it or not, you would be, you wouldn't, you would be surprised to know that even in large brokerages, their employees do not follow up. Like they let the leads go because as salespeople, you're taught to just keep going. When you get a lead, you try to convert that person. And if you can't convert that person, then you move on. And I've learned from my business, my personal experience that the money was in the follow-up. You know how many times I would follow up with people and they're like, oh, thanks for following back up with me. I couldn't find the emails. They would have so many different reasons and they would thank me for following up with them. So I can't emphasize that enough, Tyler. Even if you cannot get them immediately and you call later, just make sure that even when you call later, follow up because chances are the broker might have screwed up and didn't get their car moved the, or maybe they just wasn't ready at the time and now they're ready, so follow up. Lee Jones asks, can you do both jobs being a broker and the owner of your own hauling company, giving your own drivers loads? Okay. So Lee, if I understand this correctly, you're asking if you could be a broker and car hauler. I get asked this question so often. Yes, you can be a broker and car hauler. However, according to the people over at the FMCSA, I've called numerous times and asked this question over and over again to make sure that they're giving me the right answer because we all know sometimes salespeople or people, customer service people don't really know the rules for the companies that they work for. But anyways, and they all have told me you can have a broker and call in business, but they have to be two separate entities. So what does that mean? You cannot be, I cannot be Relo Geek as a broker and then be Relo Geek as a call hauler. However, what they, what I tell people is there is a way around that. And that is simply if you're Relo Geek, for instance, as a broker and you want to, and I wanted to start a call hauling company, I could call it Relo Geek trucking or Relo Geek car hauling. So that way people still have that association even though it's two separate companies legally. And then you can put it under one website. Now, I you, I say talk to an attorney about this part, so don't take my word for it, but I would do it if it was me. I would put it under the same website. I would specify that I'm a broker and a car hauler, and I would put both MC numbers at the bottom, and then that's it. That's all you have to worry about. All right, Mark McKinney. Hello, Ashley. Once I finish training and officially start my business, do I need to have money on have for carriers that may need advances and how long before I see money in my pocket? Okay, Mark, excellent question. This is a misconception about brokering. 
As a freight broker, you have to pay the drivers usually before you get paid. Why? Because usually companies are paying you in 30, 60, or 90 day increments, meaning they only bill on a 30, 60, or 90 day schedule. So your drivers are going to want to be paid when they do the load. So that's where factoring companies come into play. However, with auto transport, you don't need to you don't need to pay the drivers out your own pocket. The only time that happens is in the case of, for instance, I had a client that was a repeat client from Canada and literally they would always pay me the entire amount of the money. So their move always cost the same amount because they were always going from the same place. So it was like $1,200 and they would pay me the full amount, including my service fee of 300 at the time. And then from there I would pay the driver. Um, and, but those cases are rare. Usually you collect your broker's fee up front or on the dispatch, or if you want to wait to delivery, I talk about this in Relo Academy. It's your choice. I go into detail about each one of those, but usually the customer pays the driver on delivery. That's the great thing about being an auto transport broker. As I've um, hinted at in numerous videos, the difference between freight and auto transport is that you don't need factoring companies. You don't need to have capital starting out, except for the amount of money you need to keep your business going and pay your monthly bills. But other than that, you, the customer is responsible for paying the drivers. You collect your fee from the customers. Okay. So, um, Shannon asks, says, good, good afternoon, Ashley. What's the first service product information from your company you recommend for like myself to purchase from company to start a call hauling business. Okay. So I'm not sure I understand your question and it could just be me. It's Monday. It's a holiday. Maybe my brain is on holiday weekend still. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, if you want to start a call hauling business, what product from myself do I recommend you buy? Well, I recommend that you buy my call hauling course. It's called haul and hustle H A U L A N D hustle.com. Um, you can go there and it's only 197 currently. I only have one package for it and it's going to guide you through a little bit about starting the business and letting you know like what to expect and what, what steps to take. But on the back end of it, it talks more when you get into the other modules, it talks more about the business side. And the reason for that is because a lot of people, it's so easy for you to learn how to load a truck. It's so easy for you to, um, like literally hack your way through starting your car hauling business. The hard part where drivers go wrong is they cannot run a business. They don't know how to grow their business. They don't know how to get clients. They don't know how to deal with clients. They don't know how to book a load. Like these things are more important and you cannot find that information out there. Like nobody is helping you with that. So when I made my course, I could have focused on the other stuff, getting started, but that's so simple. Like there's so many resources out there for getting started. It's the running the business. That's going to make the difference between you being one of those companies that is killing it right now. And you being one of the companies that are spending time on social media and blogs talking about brokers are making us broke. That's going to be the difference. And so if I had to recommend one product that I offer would be my car hauling course. With that being said, it's still not the magic solution. You still need to put in the work. You still need to do your job. You still need to figure out how you could take the knowledge that I give you and put it into your business as yourself. But that's what I would recommend. James Hill says, how do I get started? I have a truck and trailer, DLT number, MC number, insurance. Well, it seems that you have everything you need. So now you just hop on and James Pookie mentioned, um, he did respond to that person's question and said, get registered with central dispatch or mayhem Mannheim, sorry, or Odessa. If those of you don't know, Mannheim is an auto auction, um, place and Odessa is also, it's like, um, like an auction place as well. So those are good points. Like you can get started with auction houses and stuff. Um, central dispatch is going to be like your main go-to. Again, if you go to relogeek.com slash resources, I list other load boards as well. And from the jump, I tell everybody, think in long terms. So think in term of your future. Start trying to get these clients. Start trying to bring in your own clients because let's face it, brokers aren't paying that good. And it's not really, I don't want to say it's their fault. A lot of them don't know any better. See, I w when I be was a broker, I had trucking experience. So I knew what it was like being a truck driver. And I know what it's like to get paid good. And I know what it's like to get crap pay. So for me, I knew the difference. And this is something also that I teach in my car hauling course is the difference of knowing when to negotiate with brokers. Like people don't realize that you can negotiate with brokers, like brokers, what they put on central dispatch is not set in stone. I know this for a fact because literally I would call up brokers and 
I just by based on my knowledge and seeing the board, I would be like, man, I don't want 650 for this car from Florida to Texas. I want 750 and I'll know how to negotiate with them. And that's the difference between being profitable and not. So, um, with that being said, Central Dispatch, yes, Manaheim, yes, Odessa, get those badges, get that access to the auction house. It's going to be beneficial to you. But my main thing is get your clients from day one. Set yourself up to get clients from day one. I can't emphasize that enough. Okay, so Mark Smith, two more questions. Mark Smith, is it possible to make a hundred grand a year as a freight broker? Freight broker, I'm guessing you mean freight broker, freight broker. Um, not necessarily auto transport in that case. Hell yeah, it is possible. It's going to take time as a freight broker on average from talking to a few freight brokers. It takes you at least six months before you even start seeing a little bit of traction. It is so hard as a freight broker because you got to get people to trust you with these items. And a lot of these loads are a lot of money. So you're asking them to trust you with millions of dollars worth of loads. So with that being said, once you're up and running, you can make a lot more than a hundred grand as a freight broker. Now, as an auto transport broker, I'm going to say this. It's a lot harder to make a hundred grand. However, it just depends on you. I can't emphasize this enough. If you are pulling in your own clients, if you're getting out there networking, going basically, I don't want to use the word door to door, but it's like me saying an analogy. Like if you're busting your butt out there doing what you need to do to get people through your doors, and then you're also converting leads like a rock star, you're keeping your expenses low. This is a big one because this was one of the things that was a game changer for me in my business was cutting out all that extra bull crap I had paid for and dropping down to running a lean, simple business. And that translates into my life. I run a very simple life. Like you guys probably noticed this, like I'm not fancy. Like I don't buy expensive stuff. Like I still have my 2008 F450 dually truck that I drive. Granted, I am about to get another vehicle, but I don't, I keep things simple. Like I don't have a whole bunch of furniture. I don't have a wardrobe full of clothes, though I do love to eat, obviously, but I am a simple person. And when you run your business, if you can keep living a simple life and only keeping the necessities and approach your business the same way, you're going to make a lot more money than the broker or the person who has a flashier lifestyle to live up to. I'm not saying you can't be flashy. Like by all means, do your thing. Like it has nothing to do with me. I'm just telling you what worked for me. And it's a game changer. However, it's about how, it's not really about how much you make. It's how you spend your money. And if you can wrap your head around that concept, you will do fine. Now to be more realistic and answer your question, can you make a hundred thousand dollars a year as a broker? Yes, you can, but it depends on a lot of factors. One, how many cars are you moving per month? Is it just you moving these cars? But to answer your question, yes, I hate income questions because I don't want to set unrealistic expectations for you guys. I want you guys to know the real deal. There's a lot of brokers out there that barely make a thousand dollars a month. I don't want to give you guys a whole bunch of hopes and dreams that you think this is going to be your big ticket to you know success. It's hard work being a broker, being a call hauler, running a business is hard work. And you don't know that until you actually do it. Like we all see the pretty side of things and we don't see the ugly and the ugly is sometimes you get tired. Sometimes you're sick and you still got to work because if you don't work, you don't make no money. So just keep that in mind, Mark. Um, and the last question is from Alex. He says, owner operator or company driver. This one's a simple answer. Can you afford to be an owner operator? Do you have the passion to be an owner operator? Do you want the drama and expense required that's uh, that's going to come with being an owner operator? If you answered yes to those questions, then yes, become an owner operator. However, if you have a family to take care of, if you need health insurance, if you cannot afford to start your own business, or if you just do not have the drive or the motivation to be your own boss, then be a tr- company driver. There is absolutely, positively nothing wrong with working for a company. And I don't want, I know I talk a lot about starting your business because that's what I do. I'm a business consultant. However, I want you guys to know there's nothing wrong. If you're a broker or you're, or if you want to close your business and you decide, or you don't even want to start a broken business, you just want to work for somebody. Sometimes, a lot of times I talked with a company the other day, like, well, it's not really the other day, but a month ago, two months ago. And they told me that a lot of their salespeople make over a hundred grand. Like a lot of their agents make over a hundred grand a year. Like, so it goes down to, 
Are you motivated? Do you want that? It's just not everybody wants to be a business owner. So if that's not what you want to be, then don't be that. And that's my true, honest advice for you. So there, that's it. This, I know I told you guys I was only going to answer one or two questions, but this is my gift to you on this Memorial Day. Um, so that's it for this episode, episode seven of the Ship More Cars podcast. Thank you guys for listening. I will talk to you guys in the next podcast. I'm Ashley from ReloGeek.com. Now get out there and make moves happen.